So, as uh, some of you already noticed, this is our big news. We did the, the uh, collegiate pen testing championship or the regional contest and we won first tries. Uh, pushing Stanford out, so Stanford is at risk of not going to the Nationals, which is something I never expected. Beating Stanford and three univers two University of Californias and an awful lot of famous four-year colleges. Um, it doesn't make much sense that we're beating those colleges, but we are, and it's all up to the team. So, you know, they, they've been studying hard. They've been doing uh, hack-the-box challenges, and they've really been working hard to get good at it. So I'm very impressed. Yeah, this is great. And of course, it may be helpful politically at the college. You may be able to talk to them into not firing so many of us and giving us money and stuff like that. So yeah, the Hoover Institute. Yeah, I don't know what that is. Caltech, uh, Caltech, I guess, did not compete in this this year. Um, I don't know if Caltech ever competed. Are they there? This is the Western region. So they would have to have been in this. A lot of colleges didn't compete. It looks like UC Berkeley didn't compete this time either. Um, yeah. Anyway, Stanford was number one for a long time. So, um, and they've been the host. So, you know, I figured Stanford was unbeatable, but apparently not. So I'm very pleased with our students. I had nothing much to do with it at all. I'm the official coach, but I didn't do anything. They did it on themselves. But, you know, this, uh, it's good. It's, it shows, you know, that, that the students here are learning good stuff. It's, of course, the stuff they're doing here goes far beyond our courses. The courses just get you started, and there's a lot more work. Anyway, um, oh, I didn't know that. Okay, so Hoover run is fund Stanford. Well, Stanford's rolling in the money, so that would make sense. Anyway, uh, there's a few other news articles that are kind of fun here. Um, these guys got sanctioned. This is a uh, advanced resistant threat group that tr uh, attacked a oil and gas refinery in Saudi Arabia and tried to kill people. They tried to override the safety features, but they were unsuccessful. And that happened a couple of years ago. I knew about that at the time. Um, but now the United States has officially sanctioned them, saying anybody that invests in that company, we won't do business with them anymore and such, which seems to be like the least you could do. Uh, all right, a lot of people, this is an issue I've talked about quite a lot. You know, what we do here is not really science. We can't really prove that what we're doing is valuable. And, you know, a lot of people are frustrated. Um, so CISOs, the security officers, are pretty upset, feeling like uh, the products they're buying are not really very good. Most of them don't really do their job very well. And everybody's pretty frustrated. That's like one thing I've noticed, everybody's getting ransomware. There doesn't seem to be anything you can buy that is commonly bought that really stops ransomware. They buy stuff and it's not good enough and the ransomware gets through. And, you know, they're sort of fed up with this. I mean, why don't we sell products that work? Um, it... It's, too, it's hard, so there's just a lot of complicated recommendations, like you take all these classes, you hire a bunch of professionals, and you still get hacked. So it is understandable people are frustrated. Anyway, um, so this company that runs these uh, monitoring software, I've heard so much about it, I'm not using it, thank God, but if you take a certification exam or many college exams, they will make you use this special software that tries to tell if you're cheating by looking if your eyes are moving and all sorts of things. And it, people say it's incredibly invasive, incredibly difficult to put up with. It keeps on accusing you of cheating when you're not cheating. And uh, people are very frustrated. And so people are trying to post exposés of how it doesn't work. And the company, Proctorio, is suing them because they think the exact technique of how this stuff works is a secret. And if people found out exactly which facial movements it was monitoring, they would use it to, to cheat on the tests. So they're suing people for exposing secrets when they reverse engineer the product and figure out how it works. So anyway, uh, that's a pretty hot topic as all the remote learning is causing people to uh, use this anti-cheating software everywhere and it doesn't seem to work well enough. So this is Andy Slavitt. He was a real uh, White House health official, I think in the Obama administration or something like that. And he has a lot of good information and a good podcast. So he's talking about what's happening here. Um, you know, we're headed for the biggest surge of coronavirus. It's already started. And uh, anyway, there's quite a lot of information here. Uh, deaths will rise and things will get much worse before they get better. And, uh, you know, especially since a large number of Americans don't think any, don't believe it's true at all. And they aren't wearing masks and aren't doing anything. Um, anyway, colleges, uh, 
you can do a good job. Apparently, Boston University did a good job and only had 150 cases. University of Wisconsin didn't bother to do good measures and had 3,500 cases. So there are limits. Um, but the main thing is, if you test everybody, whether they have symptoms or not, and you absolutely isolate them, then you can contain the virus. This is not rocket science. This is what nations exceeded do. America doesn't actually have any isolation worth the damn ready contact tracing, as we've seen. Both the president and the vice president get exposed and then carry on work like nothing is wrong, not isolating at all, not wearing masks, not doing anything, just spreading it willy-nilly like they just don't care. And uh, that's where we're at. Anyway, like I say, the thing that works is mandatory testing and isolation. Like I've heard in China, you know, if you test positive, they come drag you out of your house. They put you in a place. They lock the door. You can't get out for two weeks. That's it. There's no nonsense, no excuses. You know, that's what it takes. Anyway, uh, let's see. Darknet Diaries. Yeah. Uh, yeah, good. About the oil refinery. Oh, good. I see. The Darknet Diaries about that oil refinery. That's a good thing to know in the, uh, in the chat there. All right. And let's see what else is fun. Oh, this one I thought was really fun. Um, so I think because of Elon Musk's program, there are now space flights that are relatively cheap. You can now send a small package to space for uh, either two or $8,000. So these guys had a question, can fireflies light up in space? And they decided to just do it. They got $8,000 donated someplace and they made a little box. They were gonna send real fireflies, but they found out the fireflies will not light up if they're scared and they're gonna be scared on the rocket. So they made chemicals that will mix the chemicals from fireflies to see if it lights up. And they did light up, but you know, that's pretty awesome. Kids can make a real space project and for not too much money, they can really send something to space. So that's good. And that reminds me of the other thing I wanted to tell you from here, we have a lot of upcoming events. The Gray Hat Con is coming up and we're doing a lot of workshops there. If you go to anything there, it's all worth extra credit. There's a CTF that is supposed to be very easy and appropriate for beginners coming up. So uh, capture a flag competition where you practice uh, decrypting things and hacking into vulnerable systems and such. So that would be very welcoming, I think, to my students. Many people would be able to do it and it's worth extra credit. And a talk next Tuesday, or election day, um, not a week from Tuesday, which I highly recommend. I've seen some of what she's doing. She's doing awesome stuff, um, picking up photographs from satellites and uh, just a lot of stuff. So this will be fun uh, hacking space objects. All those things are worth extra credit. I recommend doing some of them. All right. And uh, I don't think I'll bother with these. We're only got a minute or two. Let's see what's good. Um, and that stuff is a little, yeah, this one's good. So YouTube DL was an extension in a browser to download, um, uh, um, YouTube movies. And yeah, November 3rd, election day. Yeah. And uh, they, GitHub used a takedown notice from Recording Industry Association, taking it down based on um, copyright. And everybody got very angry. So now there are hundreds of clones of that repository. And here's something I didn't know you could do. You can take the source code and you can convert it into an image losslessly. And so these two images contain the entire source code. So that's retweeted and retweeted everywhere. This is what people usually do when they get angry about internet censorship. Um, if they find ways to encode the information and spread it far and wide in many forms so that there's no way for any agency to really take it down. So anyway, uh, that's a new one, but that's happened many times. Anyway, we're up to the official time here. So let me close some of these. And there should be another page behind there. Okay, so here we are. We're up to chapter 10. Uh, the midterm grades are up. I just put them in uh, the City College system and in Canvas. So check that out. I see most people are getting an A, which is what you should do. We all have to do is there are lots of opportunities for extra credit. Anyway, so I'm very up to enterprise services. And this is something that a lot of students are unfamiliar with, and I'm only partly familiar with. If you work at big corporations, they use these big products and small networks often don't use them. Now, of course, everybody uses this stuff, although they may not understand it. They got to use DHCP and DNS to properly uh, address their machines. So DHCP assigns automatic IP addresses to machines. This is used almost everywhere for client machines like laptops and desktops. Servers don't use it because you want them to always have the same fixed IP address. And, um, but anyway, this is commonly what you do and it pushes out all the information you need to get to the internet, including the address of the DNS server. And it does it over UDP 67 and 68. It's a very old protocol. 
And this is a very old problem. When you boot up your machine, it has a MAC address built into the card, but it does not have an IP address. It gets a different IP address every time it moves to another network. So it has to ask for an IP address. And it does that with a four-way handshake using DHCP. And that's called the DHCP lease. You send out a broadcast saying, help, I'm new here. I need an address. And then DHCP server says, okay, use this one. And you say, well, all right, I'll use that one. And then it lets you have it. And, uh, that's fine. And it also makes sure that nobody else is using that address typically. And so now you have a lease to hold that address for some period of time, typically like four or eight days. And then you will have to renew your lease or be given a different address. So what that means, of course, is that if you are looking at log data in Splunk or something, and you find an IP address of an endpoint, it's entirely possible that that endpoint has changed. And that IP address on one day is reused for a different device on a later day. So you really need to know what, which DHCP was assigned to which MAC address on which day if you want to find out, say, which machine is being used for an attack or infected with a virus or something. So if you're going to do searches, you're going to have to have a record of these DHCP logs. So if you use a Microsoft DHCP server, which is not a very common thing to do, but you can, then it has a plain common delimited log here that it keeps. Um, it uses local time, which is pretty annoying. You really would rather have everything in universal time, especially large companies that go across many time zones. Um, and the logs are only retained for a week, so that is very likely not to be enough. So you'd probably want, if you're gonna use a Microsoft DHCP server, you'd have to uh, write a script or otherwise keep maintain those logs longer. If you use the ISC DHCP, which is the more common DHCP server on Unix systems, then it uses the syslog service and syslog has a way that's automatically designed for a long time to send signals off to anywhere you want to accumulate the logs. Um, central logging has been around much longer on uh, Unix systems than on Windows systems. And they have a syslog service and you can configure it to send it anywhere you want it to go. So the logs look like this. This one goes in a dhcpd.log. And so it just has information here. You know, it's sent a DHCP acknowledgement and a DHCP inform. And that gives you a MAC address and an IP address. So you know who had that IP address at a time, and therefore you can figure out what's going on. Here's more of it, DHCP discover, DHCP offer. Here's a lease request, DHCP request, and DHCP act. Those are the four DHCP packets that you'll see in the four-way handshake as you um, get an IP address. And then there's DNS, of course. Um, very few people address anything directly by the number. What they do is they use alphabetical IP addresses like ccsf.edu, and even to refer to other machines on your own network, you typically use a DNS name, especially on Microsoft networks. And so you um, have to constantly convert those alphabetic names to numbers, and this is done by your DNS server. And this turns out to be important both for logging and it's a common area of attack. By giving you a malicious DNS server, I can trick you into going to the wrong address. And this is why right now everybody's freaking out as we move to encrypted DNS, DNS over HTTPS. A lot of people are very upset saying we are gonna lose our primary logging technique to keep track of uh, what traffic is on our network. And that's true. Just like any improvement in privacy, it means that it's not so easy for the good guys to spy on you to watch what you're doing either. Anyway, the, the traditional uh, DNS server is Bind, the most famous one from Berkeley. And so it keeps a log. You can, it, you can turn off, you can turn on logging. It's not off by default. And then it will record the query. So here's somebody trying to resolve this domain, example.com. And they got an answer that is at this address. Microsoft has a DNS server too. And you can set it up. It, by default, it's not logging, but you can turn on logging and then... Uh, choose what you want to log, and then it will just have a nice uh, text file keeping track of the, all the resolutions. All right. Uh, but if you restart the server, it erases the old log again. So just like their DHCP server, this is probably not really ready for prime time. And almost everybody uses third-party servers. Um, another thing you can do is just log at your DNS server or in the network as you watch the package go by. And that is very common, uh, very convenient, and uh, that's what you can no longer do if you switch to encrypted DNS queries. Anyway, there's a tool just for that. And you can, it's a very easy way to keep track of what's happening on your network. So let's take a look at these cahoots. 10A.
Well, I'll give it a few more seconds. Okay, here they come. Okay. <laughs> All right, I guess that's it. Okay, IP addresses change frequently. All right, that's DHCP, good. UDP, port 68. Okay, that's also DHCP. <coughs> All right, which one retains logs for a week? All right, that's Microsoft server and Developed at UC Berkeley. <coughs> That's Bind, the original most famous one. All right. All right. X C, I think those are real initials. And that's a name I know. And all right. Those are all pretty good names. All right. So let's get back to here. Okay. So then we got some enterprise applications that are probably a lot less familiar, but they're what's used commonly, Landesk and Altiris. These are inventory and software license monitoring things. You have to keep track of how many things you've got and where they are. I know if you install Microsoft, applications these days, they make you have a Microsoft license server that will check and see how many copies of a Microsoft product you're running. So this keeps track of uh, every time you run something, what user account ran it, what machine it was on, so you can have a report of how many licenses you're using. Um, so you, and therefore, since you're going to know, uh, it's not only just for licensing, but it's also a security measure because now you know everything that has been executed on every machine and when it was executed, and attackers, of course, run hacking tools. So now you can tell. So they'll often download something like a hacking tool, run it, and then delete it, and you'll can record this. This, And then you can look for suspicious patterns of activity. So in this uh, monitor log registry key, it makes a separate key for every item, and it keeps track of when it was started, when it was last started, and all that jazz. So you can see how often people are using something. And so you can look for uh, suspicious things. There's a special... Um, tool to examine the registry hives. One, if you've uh, looking at the live registry and another tool you use, if you're looking at a exported archived registry, but you can retrieve the data from the registry. And then you can look for things. For example, things that have not been run very many times. Anything that's actually used at a company would be run every day or two. An attacking tool is probably just run once or twice and then never again. So that's one thing. Uh, look if it's run from some unusual path, not a downloads folder, not a desktop, but somewhere strange like the recycle bin. Um, see if it is run. Many strange utilities are run quickly at a weird time. Uh, that would suggest a hacker got in and now they're running a script that does a whole bunch of things to harvest data from your network and so on. This is quite common. And this is what a living off the land attack might look like. You use the net command and not sure what net one is, but then CMD and, and at, these are various 
common command line tools to do things from the command line. And normal users working do not open the command line and do a bunch of command line things typically. They typically use graphical things. So the use of a bunch of command line commands is pretty suspicious unless it's on a machine with you know sort of high-end developer that actually does that. So you can look at funny usernames, um, usernames that don't run things all the time. For example, service accounts that are used in the background to move data from one machine to another. The hackers commonly use those because they tend to be forgotten and not have uh, the passwords changed very often, um, and so on. High privilege accounts that shouldn't be logging into end devices, and so on. Uh, look for executables that ran and then they get deleted. That's, of course, very strange. Unless it's an installer, you wouldn't delete an executable normally. Um, and then Semantic makes their product. It's got this component for application metering that does the same thing, keeps track of what applications are running, and of course, lets you block applications from running. And so it has a log, which keeps track of the same kind of information, when it ran, how many times it's been run, and so on. And so you can look for executables that don't have version information. If you go to the properties sheet, many much code is signed. And even if it's not signed, it usually has a version because any kind of professional company has an endless chain of updates and patches. And if you buys a hacking tool, it probably doesn't have a version. So that's a thing to know. Um, you can look for small files and you can look for the, a file with the same size, but a different name running on many machines. Those are common patterns of suspicious activity. And then you got, of course, antivirus software. I remember 10 or 15 years ago, we used to really believe that antivirus worked. We'd say, if you're running antivirus, you don't have to worry, it'll stop all the malware. But that's certainly not true anymore. If it ever was true, it's really not true now. Um, people claim that uh, the chance of an antivirus stopping a real attack is like 2%, but it stops a certain kind of attack. It's worth running to stop the low level attacks where people do run millions of email on millions of copies of the same file. It's not worthless but it's not good enough to mean that if you're running this, you're clean. So you should run antivirus and make sure it's updated and keeping logs. And then you can find out uh, what's happening here. So it, um, all right, one problem is it of course won't block normal legitimate Windows utilities. So your more advanced attackers use living off the land attacks where they don't use malware. They just use the built-in Windows tools. That's often a trick. And of course there are tools that uh, lack of signature, it's very easy to modify tools to alter the signature. So, you know, uh, you have to take antivirus logs with a grain of salt. Um, if you do see things in the antivirus logs, that is important information and probably indicates an attack of some kind, but a higher level attacker can sail right in without setting off your antivirus. So there's a quarantine. Uh, some antivirus, you can configure it to delete the file, but you should quarantine it instead because you'll want a sample. If somebody is putting malware on your machines, you will want to take that sample so you can analyze it, find uh, indicators of compromise, and see if it's actually infecting other people and so on. So it's best to quarantine it. And uh, all right. Uh, attackers often use password protected archives like password protected 7-zip and RAR and zip files. This is because, of course, it's encrypted with a password, so it can't be recognized. And so antivirus will often log this anyway, that some file is here, it's, it's, it's zipped, and I can't open it. That's an important and suspicious activity. That is not something a normal user should be doing. All right, so Semantic has nice log files, and it also goes into the Windows event log, puts events. It has this weird timestamp for some reason where they restore 20 hexadecimal and that's a number you add to 1970 to determine the rule of this kind of weird system. So uh, that's one thing to know about it. And then it, uh, the quarantine files have this VBN extension, two files. First is metadata about the quarantine file describing it and then an encoded copy of the file. It, all of them have the property that they modify the file. So the quarantine file, you can't double click on it and run it because of course the whole point is it's a virus. You don't want people running it, but you do want to preserve it. So it encodes it in some way. The older way they just XOR every byte with 5A, newer versions use a slightly more complicated uh, scheme. And there is a tool that can extract files, but you have to get the right tool and run it on, you have to get the tool and run it on the same system that quarantined the file, which is kind of rude. But anyway, it's just, it doesn't have to, like, it's not trying to encrypt it so you can't get in. It's just trying to scramble it so nobody will run it by accident. And also, of course, so it'll stop being detected as a virus and it won't keep flagging it. Yeah. 
So many virus traffic scans NAT traffic from VMs. Well, sure, yeah. Some of them look inside VMs too. VMs are just another archive to them. Yeah. Anyway, so you can get Q, Q extract, and uh, this is a common forensic trick. If you have a forensic image with something on it, you often make a copy of it and boot up the copy. So now you're running a copy of the machine being examined, and then you can run all the tools on there. Anyway, uh, there's also somebody wrote a Python tool to uh, open up quarantine McAfee files, but it doesn't always work. Or this was uh, semantic, I think, this stuff. Yeah, this is semantic. The next competitor is McAfee, of course, invented by John McAfee, who now hates it and is just a wild man and now in prison in Spain. But anyway, uh, McAfee is quite popular and uh, it has a log, you can have logs that log all the things that happen when it is scanned, what it found, and so they're stored locally on the host. And uh, here's the logs to show what files have been quarantined or deleted. And it has quarantined files with a BUP extension. Again, two parts, an area with metadata and an area with the actual quarantine file. Again, XORed with simple uh, XOR to scramble it and then compressed. You can unzip it easily and run it through an XOR to get it out. And here's what metadata looks like. Um, for PW Dump, a common hacking tool, it just tells you a little bit of information. Uh, what its original name was, what time it created it, and so on. Not anything terribly exciting, but that's what you get. Then there's Trend Micro, does the same thing, stores logs locally, plain text, uh, recording what it did, and quarantines files. And uh, you can take them apart with a thing called VS Encode. We'll remove, we'll decode the encoded files. All right, so here's uh, another set of cahoots. This should be 10B, all right. Aha, I run on forums that users of antivirus like Bitdefender have complained about their personal files being completely deleted. Oh, I have not heard that. And that is certainly not a common issue. That's very rude. That is not something most people put up with. Hmm. That's a serious defect. Obviously, it should not be deleting your personal files. That would be another reason to, uh, you know, to archive anything instead of deleting it. But no, that, that is certainly not normal that it uh, deletes useful, innocent files. That's a serious bug. There's one that comes by every five years or so. I think McAfee did like 10 years ago, where it actually deletes important Windows system files and breaks your machine. You know, they do make mistakes, but, but those are serious mistakes. And of course, nobody wants that. And that's the kind of thing that will make people switch to a different company. So they patch that stuff in a hurry, usually. All right. Well, looks like I've got some people. All right, let's go. All right, an unusual six byte timestamp. All right, that's semantic. All right. Execution logs in the registry. That's Landesk. These others are antivirus. That's a, a software compliance monitoring tool. Um, Land desk that keeps track of everything you run, malicious or not. All right, which one makes BUP files? It was McAfee. All right. Yeah, hard to remember that stuff. 
All right, which one of these is not suspicious? That's it, the installers. This is normal. You run an installer and then you discard it. All the rest of these are not normal activities. All right. All right. All right. Good. All right, so then there's web servers, of course. Um, yeah, oh, good. I see people giving me more information. Good, I'll make a note of that. About a name, good, I got it. Okay, so uh, the main most common web servers are, of course, Apache and IIS. Um, they both do the same thing, and a web server is just a fancy file server. You can make a request for some data, and it sends you some data. So the browsers send HTTP requests, most commonly a GET or a POST. A GET asks to see a page. A POST sends some data up, and then it replies through doing something like logging in or sending up a credit card number or something. Um, there are other methods, but those are the common ones. HTTP was the original web on port 80 but it had no encryption, so almost everybody's switching to HTTPS, the secure version, on TCP port 443. So uh, you typically put multiple websites on the same server, just to make them cheaper. So you have, um, when you get a request, the request specifies not only the IP address it's sent to, but the host name, the particular domain name you're trying to reach, in case I have multiple domains. And this is true of my website, by the way. If I go to mine, I'm running on a Cloudflare free HTTPS connection. And so if I look at my certificate and go to details, there used to be a big old list of all the uh, domains in here. And maybe I'm not going to be able to find it in this browser. Uh, let me see, I do one more thing. No, I guess I'm not going to be able to find it. Let's see, the way to get more details. Uh, anyway, I, there's about, there's like, cooking sites in Poland, and all other sites that are sharing my certificate. Um, other browsers make it easier to find that. Something like 100 different websites are sharing my certificate. Um, anyway, so that's what happens. Those are things that are called virtual hosts. And if they're actually all hosted on the same server, which ours are not, they just pass through the same proxy server, then of course, if one of them gets root on the server, they can take over the other. And so I've heard about this quite a lot on GoDaddy hosting. Uh, one person has an insecure site and they mess around with it and infect the others. I don't know exactly how that works, but a common belief is that they're compromising the server and then getting other sites on the same server. Anyway, you got log files on the web server, uh, so they're stored typically in plain text, not encrypted and not signed because these things were set up long ago before people thought about it so much. And they keep track of the requests, you know, IP of the client, the URL you wanted, and what happened um, if you turn on that kind of logging. So you can now search on your web server to find things requested a certain time to a certain IP address containing user agents or URLs. These are things you commonly do in Splunk and other log monitoring tools to track down traffic associated with some kind of suspicious event. Another very common issue is you don't want your website going down, so you don't have just one server. You have a pool of servers, and you have a load balancer in front of it, like an F5, that takes the traffic that appears to be coming to one address and then spreads it out to different servers. So that means your logs might have an IP address of a load balancer and not the client, so you don't really know which server it went to. And uh, that's an issue. It's true of my website. My website is behind a Cloudflare reverse proxy, so it does mean that the requests and the logs do not contain accurate addresses in the expected place. Anyway, all right. So you can uh, configure a load balancer to add some header fields. Cloudflare has this option too. You can configure it to add extra header fields to the request to record the actual address before the address was modified. All right, so then you got your content. Um, hackers often hack a website and then they add 
malware to your web page or they store malicious files on your web page. This is a common thing you do, or they put a PHP on page on there. It's used as a web shell or a root kit. That's typically what you do. Often you find obfuscated PHP up there and so on. So I've done quite a lot with obfuscated PHP. Let me zoom this in a bit just to show. This is what you typically see. They just have scrambled letters. They rename all the variables and all the methods, long scrambled letters. This one defines a variable called OIL that has a lot of letters. And then it takes letters one by one out of this string and builds the commands one by one. The point is not really to hide it from you. It would be very easy, and I've done it a lot, where you just run this and stop it and print something out. You get it to decrypt essentially its product. The point of this is to avoid automated scanners and to fool uh, low-level analysts that just try to read it and then give up when they can't immediately read it. Anyway, that's, that's obfuscation. So what, that's the general properties of all web servers. And then you can just choose the software you're going to use. Apache is the open source free product. You can run it on Windows, but it's almost always running on Linux. It's a very old product. So it's really confusing. You have several configuration files in different folders that can override each other's configurations. And there are many contradictory tutorials telling you to put things in different places. So it can be pretty annoying to use, but it's free and it's very common. Um, all right, it has log files in plain text and you can set it to log things however you like. You can give it a configuration file to cause it to log extra headers if you like. You can turn on Apache forensic logging, which is true on some of my servers, which is expensive in CPU. It causes your server to slow down, but then it keeps a complete log of every request and response. Uh, Apache is quite well documented, yes. Apache is the most common open source product, and there are tutorials and lots of documentation, yes. The one that's not well documented is Nginx. For a long time, Nginx was originally designed to run criminal botnets, and there was no documentation at all, and then all the documentation was in Russian, and now somebody bought it, and it's becoming more professional. Nginx is a cleaned up version of Apache to run much faster, um, and uh, it's becoming increasingly popular. It can do more, uh, serve up more customers per minute at the same price, uh, but it is it was not as well documented. Anyway, so, you put your content in a special folder like var wwhtml, and um, you can re you can put it somewhere else, but that's typically where it is, and uh, that's that's the open source option. Small companies typically use it because they're it's free. Large companies almost always use Microsoft IIS because they are a large company with many locations and many employees all over the world, and so they have to have a Windows domain controller which gives you what you need to manage large networks like that and do difficult business things like have two companies merge because one company buys another company and now you have to integrate their whole network into your network and Microsoft is there for you. They have got the tools to do that on those domain controllers and Linux is totally not there for you. It doesn't play at that scale. The software is not there. Microsoft has taken over and they're the only company that really has the tools you need to manage really large international domains. And therefore, once you're using Microsoft domains, you have to use Microsoft everything to make it work properly. So uh, it's why the large companies, large corporations almost all use IIS, which is Microsoft's web server. And uh, it's of course not free. You have to pay for a server version of Windows. You have to pay licensing fees, and then you control it with Windows. So um, you control it through control panel. It's got a configuration file. You can set it to uh, put your, your uh, web directory somewhere else. By default, it's in inet pub. And you have log files that are stored in a particular format. They're plain text, but they might contain Unicode characters. Uh, Microsoft is pretty addicted to an old-fashioned version of Unicode with 16 bits per character because um, Microsoft has been international for a really long time, and they set their standards uh, at a time when the ability to support inter international languages was pretty weak. So you have a log file that looks like this. It has a header telling you what fields are here, date, time, source IP, um, the URI, client IP, and so on. So you have a complete record of uh, what was done. All right, and if you're gonna have a Microsoft web server, you'll typically have a Microsoft database server. If you have a Linux web server, Apache, you'll typically have MySQL. And if you're really big, you pay for Oracle, which is really expensive, but it is the handles the largest amounts of data. So your database, you got evidence to keep track of. You want to keep track of the IP addresses of people that come in. 
the errors of malformed queries and query logs, which you could enable showing normal queries that like Apache forensic logging will be expensive and fill your server with log files of innocent events. Normally you just go with the error logs because it's hackers who are trying to hack in will cause errors typically. So your storage in a database server is typically very big on a uh, multi-disk array like a storage area network. Um, and so you typically don't mess with it directly. Um, and you don't try to image it directly for forensic purposes because it's too big and expensive. It's filled with a large amount of real data and a huge amount of normal legitimate transactions. So you don't want to capture all that. You want to find just the exceptions and look at them. So Microsoft has SQL Server. There's a free version, SQL Server Express, uh, but most people get the real MS SQL, of course, and this gives you all the Microsoft uh, controls. You have a special tool to manage it, SQL Management Studio, and it has logs. So here's a log of a, a um, an error because somebody gave you the wrong password, and here's a record made of a successful login. Those are both things you'd want to record. So if a person's trying to guess the password, you'll see a bunch of wrong passwords and then a correct password, and then you'll know that you were attacked and they did find the password and get in. So you can log queries if you want to, but this is not recommended on a production server because it wastes a lot of CPU and slows down the performance of your server, which is a perennial problem at database servers. They typically have trouble keeping up with the load and you really want them to move fast. If you want to preserve the evidence, you could do a forensic image of the whole database, but that's very big and expensive and you typically don't want to take down the server. You can copy DB files from Microsoft servers, or you can use a tool to just query the database to get the evidence you need, which is what you typically do in the spirit of a live response. It's not perfect, but it is usually the efficient way to get the information you need without getting just a huge amount of extra information you don't need. Then there's MySQL, the open source alternative, goes along with Apache. Typically you have a LAMP server, Linux, Apache, MySQL, and PHP, or you have Microsoft's version of everything. So you got a configuration called my.conf. I don't know why, I think CNF is what the other one should be. Anyway, then you have various log files to keep track of what's coming in and out. And you can, uh, only thing it records by default is errors for the same reason. You can turn on a more complete log, but then it'll be a high overhead slow down your server and use a lot of space on the disk. And so here's a general log showing here's somebody connected and it executed a query and got some information, which you know is fine, but that you're gonna have far too much of that going on, innocent, harmless activity. So um, if you want to record records from MySQL database, you could image the hard disk, of course, or you could stop the service and copy the data if you want the whole database. Or you could, of course, query the database to get information of targeted records. And then there's Oracle, very expensive. Uh, the college uses it. We have this proprietary service using Oracle. A lot of governments use it, insurance companies, banks. Uh, and it uses, it's a different service, but it's the same. It's a relational database. It has its own language. You can take Oracle classes at City College and get certified in Oracle. And at least 10 years ago, they said you'd make a lot of money learning how to run Oracle. It's difficult to run and they pay high prices for Oracle administrators like uh, advanced Microsoft Windows domain administrators. I don't know if that's still true, but I imagine it is. Um, you use it for huge databases. It, for a long time, there was a belief that Oracle was much more secure than those other databases. And about eight years ago, DEF CON had a bunch of talks on how to do SQL injection on Oracle. And people freaked out and government agencies came in and said, we're going to arrest you and you shouldn't expose this information when they finally had to like get off their high horse and admit it. It's just like everything else. It's subject to SQL injection, just like the other ones. And they have to have uh, filters and be aware of that. Anyway, um, so here's a successful connection to an Oracle database showing user equals Bob has established and gotten in. So you can, uh, again, it has minimal logs unless you turn on an extensive loading, which slows down the server. All right. So that's a very simple overview of some very common uh, products that you should know about. 10C. All right.
All right, I guess that's enough. All right, free and open source. Patchy, good. All right. All right, which one will conceal IP addresses for server logs? Load balancer it translates the addresses, so it will not be as easy to tell where things came from. All right, which one is free but not open source? The Express version of SQL Server. For a long time, Microsoft used Express for the free version of things. These days, they seem to use community for the free version of things. Those are common keywords for the free version of Microsoft proprietary software. But it's not open source. You don't get to see the source code. You just get to use it for free. All right, a tool used to manage a database server. That's it, SQL Server Management System or something like that. That's one of Microsoft's management tools. All right, and which one logs connections by default? Hmm. Yeah, I think Oracle does to some extent more than the rest but they're all pretty uh, minimal about it. All right. That's far as, okay. XC, I've got that before six. And Wilson, all right, That's six for Wilson. Okay, so I've got those scores and I'll stop the recording and just stick around to answer questions. Um,